<laughs> Hello and uh, good evening to, uh, to everybody. I'm speaking, a, a, it's the second time I'm speaking to this case. It's Rod Adams from Atomic Insights. And um, I mean, he's uh, now into venture capital. But he's just a wealth of knowledge on nuclear itself. And I thought I'd invite Rod back just to have a little bit of a chat of the industry, how we see things. So uh, welcome, Rod. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. And uh, as you mentioned briefly, I'm a blogger, Atomic Insights. I podcast it. The Atomic Show podcast, which is linked in the, the Atomic Insights website. And then I've been investing, actively investing in nuclear now for about three years as part of Nucleation Capital, a venture capital firm that really likes advanced nuclear in a time to transition. The energy transition needs a good power sources, good options, and nuclear is one that is undervalued. So I like that as an investor. I I actually went to one of the companies that I'm, I'm guessing from your website that you're supporting, which is uh, Copenhagen Atomics. Mm -hmm. I paid a visit to them in was it two or three weeks ago, and I'm impressed that they're building stuff. Um, oh yeah, they're, they're definitely. This a, me. Well, they're a hands-on group of people. That's one of the reasons we mm. like them is that they recognize that the technology and the and the math and the models are mm. one thing, but you have to be able to bend metal and put salt next to the metal and see how it performs and make sure you get your pumps working and all of the hard to do things and this, unfortunately in some cases nuclear engineers tend to like to do things in you know on paper or computers these days and they don't really touch things these guys at copenhagen touch things they like to do it and they they make some good stuff and they're already selling stuff they're selling salt loops to research institutes they've figured out the importance of purifying the salt. Uh, and people who's got some experience with water cooled reactors recognize very clearly the importance of pure materials yeah. so that you get closer to those theoretical calculations you have. This, this was a lesson that I, I learned when I was at ITA is that the challenge with nuclear with its fissional fusion it's not infinite energy or energy density. We all know that works. Okay, mm -hmm. it's materials. Um, that's that's the cost driver. And and what struck me about Copenhagen is they made a decision early on to go for pragmatic materials like three one six L stainless steel, which is mm -hmm. used in structural metals. And then they focused on getting the purity of the salt right, which I thought was a very clever strategy. And I was just impressed by the fact that they are managing to sell products to desalination, the universities, all these type of things. And, you know, sort of saying, okay, well, we got to diversify our product line first, and but the end, game, end goal is nuclear. I, I thought yeah. that was so clever from a, that's a typical, there's a good startup story from that way. Well, and it's important for a startup to get practice selling things, yeah. figuring out what customers really want and having the internal processes you need to develop products and meet customer needs. And to find customers for the products you develop, that's that's a whole skill set that is part of running a business. And that's one of the things we look for in, in our ventures is how good are these really talented, skilled, brilliant engineers? How good are they at building a business, yep. finding profitable revenue streams? And, and those are important aspects. But we look for that a lot. So, so that was a point I wanted to get your view on. So, I mean, I, I'm obviously working in France. I'm now working again on the, the building of EPR2 and of EPR is still at Inkley Point. There's still things to do in all these projects. And historically, nuclear has been utilities. It's been a nationalized utility scale thing, even when it was army type of stuff. Even in the US, yes, it was private, but I think in most of them, it's fair to say the government still had to help out a little bit, right? And that's always been the, the critique against nuclear is that you can't get it privately going. I mean, what is your view on that? Like, why why couldn't it get going? <laughs> well, that's that's often a critique from competitors who right. like to overlook the fact that they have a lot of help from the government as well. Sure. And there's there aren't any uh, energy sources out there that haven't had a lot of help from from the government. It's if you look at the development of hydraulic fracturing. And, and directional drilling, there was an awful lot of government assistance involved in that. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't just in, in the technology. Uh, there was a long period of time in the U.S. where, by law, 
companies were paid extra for what they called unconventional gas. We thought we were running out of gas in the 1970s. We actually had, before the oil crisis of, of 73, we had the gas crisis of 1971, where schools in the Northeast were closing because they didn't have a gas to heat. There was all kinds of real issues with gas. So we had these provisions for subsidy payments, you know, essentially the same as tax payments for unconventional gas. And George Mitchell, uh, the guy who really pushed real hard on getting the whole infrastructure around high directional drilling and hydraulic fracturing to work, knew that he, that was an unconventional gas source and he could get more revenue per molecule of gas that he sold. And that helped a lot. That was a big motivator to get this whole thing going. Of course, famously, the wind and solar industry had lots and lots of help through oh, yeah. mandates and through subsidies and through tax credits. Feeding so, tariffs. I mean, what a subsidy. Whew. I mean, whether you use it or not, you get money from it. <laughs> yeah, well, the feeding tariffs in some, in many cases, were extraordinarily uh, generous to the developers. And that's why people knocked down the doors to try to build the systems, whether it be in Germany. I mean, Canada, they were paying 10 or 12 times market rate for the, the power coming out of the, the solar panels. No. Incredible. Well, I'll tell you this. So South Africa doesn't have, it's we're the only G20 country without a natural gas industry yet. Okay. And the reason is the government has never come around to de-risk the investment. Okay. So they, they can't, establish themselves without the government saying yes and still there the coal lobby is still quite strong because it's 80 percent coal it's, it's too mm -hmm. strong in my view but be this in may and th this is something that i didn't snap when i started working in energy it is the inherent rivalry between these various sources they, they're almost like mafias the way they act you know well it is a commodity and commodity businesses know at least the people that are good at commodity businesses know that they've got to do whatever they can to control the supply demand balance make sure there's more demand than there is supply to keep the prices profitable and they need to protect their market share and it's those are important aspects of running those businesses and so if you've got a, a new source of whether it be a new gas well, a new gas technology. I mean, look how much effort the OPEC and Russians have put into trying to discourage fracking from spreading away outside the U.S. Of course, they've done whatever they could to discourage it inside the U.S. as well. But th that fracking technology that we've come up with could be applied in a number of other basins where there's yep. the same kind of geog geography but they don't have quite the same laws. They don't have quite the same infrastructure. You know, we're happen happening to find this deep shale just above areas that we used to extract conventional oil from. And so there's all the pipes and valves and, and all of that is there already. So the infrastructure is there. So it, you know, if you want to make money in commodities, you got to understand how commodity trading works. And and you have to understand also um, a regulatory policy. So, mm -hmm. for example, um, the oil and gas industry in Europe um, had no, um, didn't care much about pushing rooftop solar and wind because they knew they were the battery of the system, if you will, because the battery didn't exist. So mm -hmm. when the Germans, for example, were attacking the nuclear and the coal fleets, they said, oh, yeah, this is better we for the environment, guys. They even put money into it. <laughs> they got mm -hmm. Schroeder. What's this? It's a Schroeder, yeah. I think was sitting on the board of Gazprom, and then people like, oh yeah, this is a conspiracy. I'm like, well, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? <laughs> well, before he went to, before he was officially working for Gazprom, while he was still Chancellor of Germany, he was the guy who led the charge to make nuclear basically outlawed, to escape from nuclear, to phase an exit from nuclear, and. He was rewarded from that effort as the chancellor. Within a, a month after leaving the job, he was hired by Gazprom. It wasn't just on the board. He was a director in charge of the 
pro the project of Nord Stream one and two. And Bringing you can't in. help but notice that, um, like, if you take Al Jazeera, for example, it's funded by Qatar, well, the biggest gas in the world. And then you get, look at the nuclear industry experts. I, mean, I think you tweeted about this the other day. The conversation is relatively decent for the first third of the conversation. Then afterwards, they get this guys like Dorf, and then all this Greenpeace funded Oaks on and say how bad it is for the climate. Yeah. Yeah, they've, 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 always, they've always had a uh, an interest. If you look through their coverage after Fukushima, it was pretty obvious where their, their interests lied interest lay whatever you want to say they they definitely want to expand their lng business interestingly the u.s lng exporting business essentially would not exist if it hadn't been for the overreaction after fukushima shutting down 50 large nuclear plants in a country like japan built the U.S. LNG exporting industry, yeah, and well, keeping I, them shut down for far longer than they should have been shut down. Well, I, I looked at Shell's recent publication of when gas is going to peak, and it's it, it's very interesting that they talk about okay renewables here and in Africa, and then they say LNG will peak in 2040 in Africa because renewables still have to scale. But they 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 say it in their stats, but they don't mention it. Japan peaked in 2010 or so. And it went a little bit up after Fukushima, and now it's going down. And they won't say why Japan is not burning gas anymore. Because they're switching from the nuclear. It's there you've got advice. Yeah. Well, and South Korea, fortunately, South Korea's reaction to Fukushima was fairly short-lived. But they did have a reaction. They did become a much bigger importer of LNG for a little while. So when J Japan did it for 10 years, they imported a lot of extra LNG. Depending on how you do the calculation, somewhere between, say, 10 and $50 billion a year in extra LNG demand from Japan. Now, of course, when Japan was buying more LNG, what did that do to the overall price of LNG throughout the world? It caused it to go up, the supply demand again. Right. So it's, it's, it's all about that one. Um we're going to sort of pivot the conversation a little bit on, on the nuclear. So I'll tell you what I'm seeing in the industry, um, what makes me optimistic. There is, at least in France, and I, I suppose it's the same in the US, because often the industry moves as one. There's now finally an admission that um, paper designs uh, need to go, that they're going to move to what the automobile industry is doing. So everything's narrowed down to a component, and you've got the spec, and then you can narrow down. So that's the first good thing that I'm seeing. The second one that I'm seeing is that um, finite element model is, models in, in the last 20 years really, but especially now has become ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And we are finally modeling connections, which is was one major issue with earthquakes and stuff. So earthquake designs and extreme weather and all of that stuff, I think they've now got it under control. And it's not just, you know, I remember 10 years ago even, they were debating um, what the best methodology is. Now it's codified in law. In, in, in design code. So we know it's the code, we know it's this method, you apply it, you shut up basically. You can't have Diablo where there's two experts debating the thing anymore. So I'm, I'm seeing these type of rationalizations occurring, okay, which makes me optimistic from a just an implementation and a design mm -hmm. perspective. What I think they're still struggling with is um, adapting to new construction methods all over. So stuff that works in skyscrapers, I think you can justify nuclear plants. Like headed bars, we we had a major issue just justifying that. It's now it's coming, but it, they're still there. So that's sort of what I'm seeing things at the moment. So I'm mean, it's seeing positive, but I still you know there's always a bit more inertia from the nuclear industry because of the safety involved. Right? No, no, let's just get your take on things. Well, I think the inertia you know, it's not really about whether or not it's safe or not. It's about proving that it's safe and accepting the proof from other industries. And that's going to be a, an issue. It's, it's slow, slower. I'm encouraged from an, I'm not a deep engineer like you guys are. I'm not deeply involved in some of the design and I know what a finite element is, but I, I don't necessarily understand necessarily the implications of that. I do know that with practice, we're going to get much better 
at doing stuff. And the practice has to include going from the design work to the actual building and then feeding back what you learn during the building process into the next designs and not necessarily changing a lot because you need to stabilize designs and be able to do things over and over again. But you have to be willing to recognize the difference between a stable design and one that's locked into stone. You can't be locked into stone. You've got to be able to update and incorporate important lessons learned to be able to go forward. But there's no doubt in my mind that if we can get moving and start doing things on a, on a steadier drumbeat, we're going to have a lot better results than we've, we've had in a long time we've, than we've ever had in the, in the West. And the nuclear done right is extraordinarily a competitive energy source. It has many features that no other energy source has. Yes, it is costly and takes a long time right now, but it can become less costly and take less time. Never going to be perfect. It's always going to, there's always going to be some trade-offs. There's always going to be times when gas might be better, when wind might be better, when solar might be better, but nuclear is going to have a strong role and it's not something that could be easily dismissed. Mm. Well, what I would say where I, I have a bit of critique against uh, some people in the nuclear space is um, they're very quick to jump on the advanced reactors. Now, I would love for them to work, don't get me wrong. But a good pressure water reactor is the best thing that we know how to do at the moment. We know how mm -hmm. it works. You can build one more. And something that I've been pitching is, um, if you take South Africa, we only have one reactor, really. Build another one, and that allows you to train your staff and your, your operations. Because we're not going to build our own reactor. We're going to buy it from somebody, right? But we mm -hmm. can still specialize in OPEX. And get your staff ready for if SMRs come you know, online yeah. in the next 10 years. Because I'm, I'm convinced in the next 10 years, either South Korea, France, or the US, or Canada, Canada's building already, and Iran is building. Somebody is going to build a reactor. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't know who, but there, there will be one. Well, I think there will be many someones, several someones at least. <clears throat> I'm really enthusiastic about the, the what I see as a really solid plan for phasing in your ability to build, own, and operate nuclear plants at the Palisades facility in Michigan. Palisades was an operating reactor or is an op it operable reactor. It shut down permanently in May of 2022. The owner gave up the operating license and turned over the facility to a decommissioning specialist called Holtec. Well, Holtec's not just a decommissioning spe specialist. They've been gradually building up a very credible full service nuclear uh, company, starting with re-racking spent fuel pools back in the 1980s and moving on to dry cast storage and onto larger pressure vessels, building their manufacturing capabilities, getting involved in designing an SMR. So they, they now own the Palisades plant. The government has asked them to restart the plant and is now is guaranteeing a $1.52 billion loan to do all the work necessary to restart the plant. Holtec, which doesn't have any operating experience yet, will start operating the plant probably within the next 18 to 24 months. And the next stage of their process is building two of their SMR designs on the site. So they'll have a team that's experienced in operating and starting up a reactor, doing all the things necessary to refuel, to load fuel, to do all the fuel calculations, to start up the reactor, to control chemistry, to do all the things you got to do to operate a light water reactor. Their SMR design is a light water reactor design. So they know all the materials are going back to your, your earlier statement. It, it, materials is a huge part. And it's not just, you know, whether and what kind of piping you use and what kind of stainless steel you use for your pressure vessel. It's all the other materials. It's the materials inside your valves. It's the materials used in your pump impellers. It's the way you balance your pumps. It's all those things that you have to know how to do. And so they're going to go from, you know, owning and operating a moderate size. It's an 800 megawatt uh, light water reactor. And then they'll start 
you know, doing their, their new reactors and use a lot of the experience and then, of course, add more experience and then more techniques. But they have manufacturing capabilities. It's just a, it's a great story. That's the kind of thing, though, that is going to give nuclear the legs it needs is to act like and be the mature industry that it should be. Mature meaning the ability to introduce evolved products that are advances, they're new and improved compared to the previous ones, doesn't have to be radically different. I mean, I consider if I go out and buy an M a BMW today, it's got an advanced engine. It may still be an a internal combustion piston engine, but it's an advanced engine. <laughs> it's got a lot of things that weren't available. The electronics, the it's the electronics to the ICE, basically. Yeah, it's, it, it's, you know, well, you well that, that's that's another point here is the um there's been a revolution in data in the last 20 years which is mm -hmm. crossing getting faster so now you have incredible sensors incredible real-time data measurement to measure long-term de de deterioration all these products so all these issues and, and this is one thing that france did well and i think canada did the same if i look what they did before france now build the new reactor because well commonly it was a bit of a disaster did they and they opened up the design again. They said, okay, what went wrong? And mm -hmm. did we measure, is it a question we didn't measure, we didn't foresee and whatever. So all of those errors theoretically should be included into the design now. And you would get a much more durable design in the long run. So mm -hmm. it can, I mean, st steam generators, uh, for example, we right now have good reason to suspect they can get to 60 years because of the alloys and, and the issues that revolve of that. Yeah, well, steam generators were some of the early real weak points. We had to, yeah replace almost every steam generator in the US um, much quicker than than we expected to based on the early designs. Uh, and so it's it's good to, to be incorporating all that information back into what we're doing. And it is it's it's dumb to think we have to throw away all that stuff. That said, there are things that large light water reactors simply can't do. And I don't understand those who resist the idea that we need to add more products to the catalog of available options for customers that aren't huge utility companies. They aren't either nationwide or at least statewide, which is what happened in the US. We didn't have any national utilities, but some of our states are as big as some nations. So it, it, you know, it, we had, and we had structures in place to allow a private company to act a little bit like a government in having regulated monopolies where if they build a plant, they could charge their customers whatever it took to pay the cost. Didn't make nuclear popular in all cases because every time we built a new nuclear plant, the utilities went back and said, we need a rate increase. But you know, that that's, did happen. But there are there is a need for advances in reactors. There, yes, we know how to build large light water. Well, we know, how to, we know intellectually how to build them. We have to practice and get better at it because it took us Flamenville, Oklahoma, Vogel. Those show that the intellectual ability to build large light water reactors may exist, but it's not very good right now. Yeah, just, especially, especially, just especially like, in Western countries, right? I, um, I can teach a dog to sing a little bit, <laughs> but not very well. Uh, you know, only a few well, notes. There's, there's something to note about them. So the US, you've got the AP1000, so it's 1,000, 1 gigawatt. France is, what's it, 1650 they've got now. Yeah. India is building 700 megawatts. Okay, and there was there was a debate, and okay, it's heavy water reactor, but there was a debate years ago in the coal industry about should you go to, how big should you go? Because obviously if you go mm -hmm. bigger, you get better efficiency, but you lose learning curves, right? Right. And the coal industry figured out between 300 to 800 megawatt was mm -hmm. the ideal range for reps. Okay. Yep. Nuclear went bigger and they lost, they made the same mistake. Indians said, we're going to do the same as the coal industry. And the Indians are building for the last time I checked. Okay. Now they, they, the structure of the economy is a bit different. Take that into account, but they build about $2 a watt. Bob mm -hmm. is 10. <laughs> UK is 10. Okay. Flamoville is eight. The yep. Indians are something like a fifth to a quarter of the price because they figured out the reactor size. Yeah, well, it's very, there's lots of data showing that single unit sites 
are always more expensive than multiple unit sites, no matter what size the reactor is. You always want to be able to follow on the initial build with another one. So if your if your size is a 1600 megawatt EPR, that means you need to have a site that needs to has enough demand close enough to take up 3200 megawatts. That's a big site, a big lumpy power insertion into any grid, no matter how big your grid is or how, and that's just a lot. I agree with you. There, there's a big reason to figure out the size a little bit better to s- take advantage of the economies of multiples so that you don't overwhelm your market. It's part of it is looking at things from a business perspective and not just the engineering. Well, it's a little bit more efficient size. It's a little bit more cost. If I can sell all the power, it's maybe more efficient. What if you can't sell all the power? What if you build your 1600 megawatt reactor and there really is only enough demand for 1200 megawatts? That makes that reactor a lot more expensive than you thought it was going to be because you're not selling all the power. So you, you got to match what the customers need. And there's a lot of energy customers out there that where a several 100 megawatt reactors is a lot better for them, a lot more matched to their needs than one 1200 megawatt reactor. That's just, well, and it's I, good that there's a variety. But what I want to get your view on is this, the UK have traditional gas cooled reactors. Mm-hmm. But they never seem to commercialize them. Now they had five different pipes. Maybe they were just managed by scientists at the time. But did you have a view as to why did large scale gas cooled reactors never scaled? Well, part of it was at the time that the that the British were trying to think about exporting their reactors. The US also wanted to export reactors. And if you could get enriched fuel at a low cost, the pressurized water or boiling water reactors could be shown to be slightly less costly than the gas cooled reactors operating at much lower enrichments. So what did the US do? US sold low enriched fuel up to 5% enrichment at a fairly low price. You know, we were the only people in the world for a while that had that enrichment capability and we used it to help establish the market. And once the market got established, once light water reactors were the thing, it was hard for anything else to come in and displace it. The gas cool reactors had some advantages, but not enough advantages to displace. And the, the reactor size was still pretty big. Uh, it Cooling a with gas means that the reactors are bigger because you need more more flow area, more volume going through. There were other gas cooled reactors. I mean, I think there was one operating in France. Uh, there was one there's in There's lots of Germany had one as well, and there's lots of um, university type scaled ones as well. So, yeah. you know, they're all over the place. Well, um, Germany's, I mean, uh, Germany's yeah. gas cooled reactor program is, is currently operating in China right now. The pebble bed triso fuel uh, reactors no. are. And even they even had the idea for the module reactors. I think they call it HTR module, um, and it's what China is now operating as the HTR PM, and demonstrating to themselves that putting multiple identical reactor modules together to provide the heat and steam for a single steam turbine is an, an idea that really has legs. They're going to be, I think, replacing coal furnaces with yes. a series of modules, reactor modules. Well, the, 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 what I'm thinking in, in South Africa from the Nuclear Energy Corporation there is that, um, well, everyone there thinks that the, it was a mistake to let go of the pebble bit, although I think they had managerial issues at the time, but yes, it may. Yeah. And the idea now is, well, they're part of BRICS, just jump in bed with either Chinese or the US with X energy and try yeah. and get. Get it back well, a little bit. The South African project, unfortunately, they made a choice early 
and pursued a path that really was a, was a dead end uh, at that point. And that path was a direct cycle, helium cooled, uh, direct cycle gas turbine with the gas turbine mounted vertically. Even though there's no such animal in the world as a 165 megawatt vertically mounted Braden cycle gas turbine. There were lots of good paper pictures of that such an animal coming out of California, but there wasn't such an animal available. And they spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do it. Eventually put the turbine horizontal and, and that was going to go fine. But even there, there aren't very many very large helium cooled Brayton cycle machines. And, well, the, the, the other issue there is you just mentioned it, it's helium. Mm -hmm. I mean, I looked at your blog uh, some time ago about the heavy nitrogen, and um, I still don't understand why people aren't doing that. Um, it just seems so from a, from a business and from an engineering perspective, nitrogen's questions have been answered. It just... Yeah. Well, the heavy nitrogen is a challenge. It really, I mean, there it is available. There is such a thing as heavy nitrogen. It's a naturally occurring component of nitrogen, N15. Um, it's about zero point three five percent of natural nitrogen so it's it's uh, a little bit more uh, natural than say heavy water or heavy hydrogen i think it's one out of three thousand five hundred parts rather than one out of seven thousand parts but it's still you still got to figure out the isotope separation and, and there are that you can buy n15 it is a, a product it's just pretty expensive at the volume is being produced today. Uh, it could be done. I still think that even light nitrogen with its activation to carbon 14 has the potential of being used in a direct cycle gas turbine. Why is there nobody doing it? Well, there's a lot of momentum. Once you start designing in one way, it's it's really hard to change and, and go to something completely well, different. The, um, X energy has stick with an helium. My, my critique against helium is handling it. Um, one, how do you test for leaks? Um, mm -hmm. It's difficult. And the second one is how do you weld? How do you weld that? How do you set it? I mean, the leak tightness is a, is a big criteria. I mean, it's not impossible. I'm not saying it's it, and they've probably figured it out. It's just mm -hmm. how I want to see how it works. You know, it, it, yeah. it will increase the cost somehow to, to well, the overall, it, you know. Helium works fine as a heat transfer fluid. If you're not trying to run it through a turbine itself, it, you can do it. It, it. it does pretty well as a primary coolant. It makes it so there's no corrosion in the primary loop. It, I mean, it'll come out pristine after 60 years of operation uh, because helium is really good at, I mean, there's no, it's inert. So that that's not a bad choice if you're going to do a steam system. And, you know, there's, there is plenty of helium in the world. Some people worry about whether it's enough, but there's plenty. There's a lot more that's not being extracted right now. We, it's still common enough that we still throw it away in children's balloons. So it, it it's going to be available. And it, I like helium-cooled steam plants. I just like direct cycle gas turbines as something to, to shoot for down the road. In the companies and reactors that you're investing in now, is there anything like you're more excited about? I mean, obviously, we talked a bit about molten salt earlier, but anything else? Well, we like one of the things, you know, mo not only do we like Copenhagen's business stuff, but we also like the fact that they are a, a breeder reactor uh, that will breed in, in a thermal spectrum. So it will convert thorium into useful material, useful fuel material. It's exciting because although there is plenty of uranium in the world there's going to be a tight market for uranium for quite some time the prices of uranium are high enough to make it worthwhile to think about uh, more efficiently using the materials that we've already mined and the materials that we're going to mine making each kilogram of uranium that you pull out of the ground worth a lot more in terms of how much energy it produces we also were excited about another, we've got another molten salt investment in core power, which is part of the consortium that's developing a, a, a fast chloride salt reactor, molten salt reactor, molten salt fast beater reactor. Um, 
and that, that that's another again it's it's one that they're not going to be using thorium they'll be using uranium and breeding plutonium and those kinds of things but that reactor is also well suited for being deployed at sea and that's what one of the things core power is is really doing is spending a lot of time laying groundwork getting the regulations in place getting the infrastructure in place to put reactors at, at sea um we have uh, another we're interested in have another interest in a breeder reactor that using lead as the coolant so lead cooled fast reactor uh, avoid some of the the challenges that sodium has um, and then high temperature gas cooled reactors we have two of those in our portfolio two developers of those in our portfolio but our, which of which of your sodium cooled reactors like are they um because I know the military has, has used some of them at the stage, but I, I don't know. There was a question of economics, I think, at one stage. Well, I mean, sodium cooled reactors have a lot of a lot of uh, good technical history. Uh, there are mm -hmm. a few developers of those that we've we've looked at, and I'm not going to put anything down on them. Some of them are really right. good yeah. designs. Or just there weren't any where there was a match between what we're looking for in a technology and what we're looking for in, in leadership or or the stage of the investment. Sometimes, you know, the companies uh, are later. We're early stage investors. We we look at the seed and Series A where we can make modest bets that may have big payoffs down the road. Some mm -hmm. of the companies are further along. They they need a lot of uh, business growth. Growth equity is what they need, and we're not in growth equity business. That's and I, I love some of the companies. It's just, it just not the the sector of the financial stack where we are. Yeah, and, and I think that's also an important point to highlight in this. A lot of this stuff, it, in my view, is getting the business done. I, I think the underlying science is interesting and, and fair. You need an expert and a brain to mm -hmm. do that. But 80, 90% of the business, in my view, is getting the business to work. And then, mm -hmm. as you say, you know, if you're not into equity, you're not into it. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, it's not our business line, but I can refer you to somebody it might be, basically. Yeah, yeah. Well, execution is is yeah. a, a key when it comes to actually running a business. And, I mean, execution is important when you're building a one-off demonstration for the government, but the government's a little less uh, demanding in some cases about mm. be, being on time and being on budget. And part of the nuclear the u.s nuclear industry at least part of its challenge has always been that it came out of the defense industry yeah uh, it's not that it was you know weapons related or whatever it's just the fact that the the companies involved grew up and had the philosophy of being defense contractors and in the defense industry a very common way to earn a contract is to come in with a with an underbid you may leave a few things off that you know are gonna have to be added later, but the customer didn't ask for it. So you mm. put in a bid that doesn't include them. And when the customer asks for it, says, well, why didn't you include that? I says, well, well, we'll add it. It's gonna cost you, but we'll add it. Yeah. So you, you underbid and you, you make your money on the change orders. That's a that's the, the way that defense contractors have worked. So, you know, when you are, starting a business using westinghouse and general electric is the initial builders that's what you're going to get so and yeah it's the same in france i mean um it, it was interesting to note um that even though the civilian french reactors were obviously struggling as in the us the french submarines seem to be okay mm -hmm. <laughs> they seem to be selling at the moment you know so yeah, yeah it seems to me they go back to what worked initially which was let's get actual military applications and then we go back to civil and I, I must say, though, um, some of those skills in military, if you're going to run a national utility, let me put it this way, you need the military mindset. You need mm -hmm. that type of organizational structure. There's no other way to do it. But if you want to run it like a startup, like a venture capital in that, mind, that mindset, that is a big challenge. And I actually, that's why I would bet if there's a country where I think this will work first, it will be the U.S., just because your market is so competitive compared to the rest mm -hmm. of the world, you have less government support for nuclear. So you will, whoever's going to come out of that will be much better placed. You know, you would have learned those lessons. And we've got uh, we've got a, a abundant startup culture 
Yeah. Where and and many, many people who've had success in that startup world and understand it and having success in it means that they've got a lot of money and they're ready to invest that money in other um, high potential investments. You know, when you've got we've got startups that have grown up in in retail, Amazon and 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 uh, data centers and and mm. space and all kinds of stuff that, that started up from you know not not always two guys in a garage or or a guy and a girl in a garage but i mean i can name a couple of companies where yeah. it started about that that size and you know they they are working their way through how to do this without not without government support or government help but without government direction without yeah. the government yeah. making all the choices without the government being seen as the only provider of funds. I, and I'm also trying to help the government understand if you really want this to, to work, and, and they're listening, they, you know, not, not just mm -hmm. to me, but to others, you're really to work. You've got to think of yourself as enabling and thinking about the ways that you can help success without necessarily spending more money. Yeah. Because it's really absurd when you have the Department of Energy getting huge budgets to give to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to slow down and review things that you really want to succeed. <laughs> it, it doesn't it, make it, sense. It, it, yeah, that, that's still a discussion that we haven't broken into yet in France. Um, you know, you have the ASN, the Agence Surety Nucléaire, which mm -hmm. is probably, it's, it's in some ways better and in some ways worse. But they, they have one obsession, which is seismic. Um, everything is an earthquake. You, you, can, you, can, you can say a tornado works, it's fine. You can say an aircraft crash is fine. But seismic, every little thing has to be qualified. And they've got seismic experts and seismic that. And eventually you say to them, guys, like my, my justification for them at the moment has been, I'll show you something that works in Japan. And if it works in Japan, it works in France. <laughs> you, can, you can bet good money on that. But that, that is yeah. where the blockage is. And, and it, this is sometimes my experience with the regulators. I don't find them too unreasonable on most things. But they, then they've got these few things that they just block. And to try and tell them that you need to be facilitators of the process. I mean, no engineer is going to say there shouldn't be seismic. There shouldn't be any anything of this nature. But you can't delay the process unnecessarily or come in during the detailed phase and then put in your requirements because you are going to explode costs. And you right. can't say it's not my problem because you're part of you're part of the industry. You have to, you know, you have to put your requirements early on. You know? Yep. And it's something that I've I've been and I've I've gotten a reputation for having beat the drum, but it's because I'm trying to use this as an example. In the US we we change the rules on aircraft impact assessment. Yeah. After all the design work was done for the AP-1000, we changed the rules. The, yes, the ground had not yet been broken on the first project, but that didn't mean that that changing it at that point was a huge change and required yes. a lot of rework because the change was made so late in the process. And that is just an example. You cannot have a regulator that thinks, well, as long as I haven't started building, everything's just on paper and I can change things. Because that stuff gets locked in pretty early. Yeah. And going back and even with computers, revising those those drawings and, and and specifications and all the things that go in is really hard work and it's very expensive and takes a long time. And and, and the thing is they take a life of their own. So it's no good example. So I, I've done aircraft crash analysis so in the beginning before this crazy rule there was a small chestnut airplane mm -hmm. in most countries in the world which is fine we know the design for it you take the thing times two or three and you say it resists fine then came this boeing 747 so you can see on on youtube it's like a wall where they crashed the airplane into it so they studied mm -hmm. this thing empirically then now in france the idea is not just okay we have a major containment building around it because it's only half a billion dollars so it's not you can argue the end of the world's money for that big capex. It's still a lot in my view, but be that as it may. Now the logic is no, but wait a minute. The building's going to vibrate. Now we need to study the individual connections down from that. 
So that's the new thing. Now you say, okay, that's not too complicated. I'm just going to upgrade the bolts. Okay. But now you've got bigger angle bolts. You say, oh, now I need to upgrade the rebar. Okay. Now you start taking it. And now the seismic guys come and say, wait a minute, you made all these upgrades. Can you please tell me it's still seismic equal of flight? I said, but I made it bigger. It's like, but that's not enough. You need documentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And well, it goes and, on and on. And, and you're just like, when does it stop? You, you have right. to say this was ridiculous from the beginning. <laughs> well, and just think about you do all those changes and make all this stuff okay. bigger and heavier. And you forgot that the base mat had requirements too, right? The, the, the oh, yeah. very bottom foundation. You, you, no, you built that to a certain level. And now you've got this much heavier structure on top of it. I've got to go back and redesign the base mat. Yep. And, and so it, 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 it is a cascading effects. And, and the question is, you know, why? What does it really? And some of the smaller reactor vendors have said, OK, rather than do all of the details, let's say everything fails. Everything just this yeah. does. But, does that but then I, I had this conversation with the safety the other day. He said to me, no, that's not sufficient because this is where the craziness comes. He said, if you have a car where everything is gold plated, it's no longer an expensive car because you don't know what's going to not work. So if, if you have a building where a part of it is seismic, you say that's the critical component. But if you say everything is seismic, you don't didn't give me a guarantee that you didn't brush over everything else. Okay, so it's not, it's, you can see where that is, that is going. So that's not even good enough. There, there has to be a point where they say stop. Now, um, where I think the reality has set in is this. The Russians and the Chinese and the um, Iranians, four people, have a very rational approach to this. Mm -hmm. They keep this, the previous requirements, they build it that way. I think they've added pre stress. The, the Chinese, as far as I know, don't even have the earth, aircraft crash as a major concern. So you're like, okay, um, look at their costs compared to us. Either their stuff is going to crash from air cranes, or they just realize that this is not a rational risk to take. And I think that is where that needs to be highlighted a bit more. I mean, Iran is now going to build 20 gigawatts, 20,000 megawatt of uh, a combination of, of uh, bigger reactors and SMRs. Mm -hmm. So you're finding all the autocratic countries don't care about this stuff. And yet here we are sitting and we've got what windmills. It's not good enough, right? So somewhere along the line, <laughs> the populations will have to rebel against this. Yeah. Well, Iran, Iran, Russia, the UAE have a very interesting reason why they like nuclear in their domestic markets. It frees up a lot more resources right. they can sell outside. They're exporters of, of oil and gas. They would mm -hmm. prefer to export it rather than to burn it in their own uh, power plants. And to maybe in some cases, they're encouraged to almost give it away to their own population. So they build the nuclear plants indigenously, use that to provide electricity, and now they can sell their oil and gas out. Now, of course, part of establishing the market for their oil and gas outside is to help keep people afraid of nuclear outside and to help right. add as many burdens as you can onto nuclear. And, you know, that's why after the 9-11 events in, in the U.S., there was this public public outroar that, hey, the, the terrorists had diagrams of Indian Point. That's what they were really trying to aim for. Hey, it's a heck of a lot easier to hit a tall, tall skyscraper than a little teeny reactor containment with a nice rounded shape to it. It's, it's not an I, easy I, I'm not even convinced that the 747 would take down Indian Point before its upgrades. Before, but before you even get to that point, could you hit Indian Point with a 747? It's a pretty small target. Well, I proposed this the other day. I said, as opposed to building this massively expensive concrete dome, which is just a thick, in AP02, by the way, there's no double containment. It's just like right. a thick slab of concrete, which makes sense mm -hmm. if you're going to do that. But I said, as opposed to doing that, why don't we just put an anti aircraft gun? $60,000. It <laughs> respects the requirements for us. You can get a more expensive one that cuts the airplane in two, maybe. Done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're really concerned about that. Or maybe find a nice, you know, valley to put your power plant on surrounded just by ask nice the military, and... can you cover this? I'm sure they want a new budget <laughs> and then make it someone else's problem. I mean, this the, the way of thinking, but again, you know, the 
the logic was we're going to do it because now we can study it analytically. Now we can have new technology. And I, I understand that logic as well, but um, the, the, the industry should never have bowed to too much safety. They should have just said that it's safe. Be quiet. Yeah. Yeah. But, and that's that's my biggest critique against them. Is they don't know how to stand up for themselves. Well, there is a, a strong evidence that some of the people involved, some of the people mm. involved in the industry, were quite happy to let regulations drive yeah. requirements and to to make it so they had to build more stuff. Because if they had to build more stuff, they had to sell more stuff, and they were selling in the early days that all of the customers for nuclear plants were either governments or rate regulated utilities in the U S mm. and if the cost went up because of a regulation change, and if they had to design a new system, the customer had to buy it, but the customer didn't really care that much because they could pass on the cost of their rate base. And as a matter of fact, the way their rate base is designed, they get a percent return on investment so the more they invest the more they make no it's just business so <laughs> it, there were, it was a a self-fulfilling prophecy so some people will say hey the industry when they stopped being able to sell new plants they decided that they would have to make their money by servicing their existing plants and by making changes to the existing plants mm -hmm. and they wouldn't make any changes unless they were required. So they had to help the regulators impose these new requirements. Yeah, it's a it's 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 a vicious circle. But I think the the end result has been they ended up where they are, mm -hmm. and you know the U.S. and France has got. To, I mean, they, they took a few knockout blows. But getting a last few on this on the AP one thousand. Okay, we obviously had Voctel, but wouldn't mm -hmm. it be logical just to build another one? And to just replicate a few of there them. will be more AP one thousands built. It's a good reactor. Yeah, there there will be more built. There will be announcements made in the surprisingly near future to most people. Right. So it's those who say that there will never be another large reactor built in the U.S. are just wrong. Yeah. And and I well, can't name names or point to customers. I can just tell you. Told you. It's it's the truth. There will be more AP 1000s. There are companies that are recognizing that, that they, they meet the needs that they have and that there's now a proven complete design where much, not all, but much of the risk has been retired. The way I look at nuclear is um, this is sort of a rule that I and Dave Nichols in South Africa came up with and a few things is like there's three numbers, which is Ten, six, and three dollars per watt, or billion dollars a gigawatt. Mm -hmm. Vogdal and HPC is at ten. Flammenville is at seven, eight, and historically we were at three. Okay, so we need to get back to where we were historically building. Mm -hmm. And all it is to me is repeta is reps. Even with the aircraft crash requirement, it will be three point five and not three. Okay, well, which it, is not the end of the world, you know. Right, and again, the aircraft impact requirements are not. It's not such that they're impossible to make, or even that they're too costly. The no. reason that I have beat up on it is that they were made at the at a very challenging time, and that they there weren't there wasn't any phase in there wasn't any a hey, we will give you ten years to get this done right. You know, it was hey, you've got a project. In this case, in the U.S., there were projects that were already through the process of getting the project approved by the rate regulator. So you already have to have a budget established. You have to have a schedule established, all that stuff. And now the requirement comes in. And nobody was willing to go back and say, well, you've just broken our complete budget hour. They couldn't go back and say, give yeah. us three years to do it all over again, and then we'll start from scratch. Because you just it, it would not have been approved. So exactly, it's 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 a regulate what I call I think regulatory turbulence. It's just the fact that you change the rules. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to organize brains. I mean, in any you in a nuclear project, you don't have to base people in every aspect of the project. So now I'm like aircraft crash. So I have to get my base people. My production is going to be totally messed up, you know. Mm -hmm. And and that's probably what happened. Then in the other one, I looked at the DOE's report on why it failed, what went wrong, which is when well, it didn't fail, what went wrong is. Um, Something like forty percent of the components were rejected at Voctel. 
okay, on site. Then mm -hmm. I spoke to some friends I know who work there, and they said to me, it's not because they were badly manufactured. It's because there wasn't enough skill to judge. And sometimes it was rejected for no particular reason. Okay. Yep. That issue has luckily been, I think, overcome now in France, and I suspect the US as well. Since 2015, France trained a lot of engineers in civil and nuclear, which is one of my fields, and other fields as well, piping and just basic old school, what I call atoms type of engineering. It's nothing fancy about three bars and concrete, right? But you need it. And when I worked on Inkley Point, when we started design, for example, I was in my 20s, 23 or something. It was one or two people maybe in their 40s and then a few people about into retirement. Mm -hmm. That, when I look at the projects now coming back after being four years in oil and gas, um, there's a far better distribution of age. That's good. And, and I think in the US it'll be similar. And that is a big, big thing because you learn from, a, you know, you don't learn from a 60 year old, you learn from somebody who's a bit older than you. Right. Yeah. That's good. That's good to hear. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Jess, should I, be, I suppose the last question on this is um, in the next five or so years, what, what are you looking out for nuclear? Um, in the next five or so years, we're going to see several demonstration reactors started up in the U.S. Mm -hmm. There probably will be some. Canada's going to have a reactor started. Yeah. Uh, there probably will be some others. I mean, Russia's going to keep pumping out floating reactor plants. Uh, China's going to start building more high temperature gas reactors and continue building the light water reactors. They'll probably uh, start doing that at a higher rate. Uh, mm. I don't know that everybody remembers, but China was on a path to be building maybe twice as many reactors as they are today. But after Fukushima, they slowed that down and they kind of mm. restricted the number of companies that could actually build reactors. I think they're going to expand that again now that they're getting more comfortable. They finally they have been playing with a lot of different reactors and they've been building various designs. I think that what they were doing was they were trying to figure out the best from each of the designs to roll it into their domestic design, the, the wall on one. Uh, there's going to be there's going to be more AP 1000s under construction within the next five years. Uh, so that I, I would say in Europe, there will definitely be the Indian EPR deal might still go ahead. Czech mm -hmm. Republic will probably be joining France now with EPR2. That's it's going to be 1200, but it's a spin off of EPR2. It's it's adaption. Mm -hmm. And then France, we're going to have a mass build again. So Good. that's definitely going to happen. So, you know, it, it makes me optimistic. I don't think I would put it this way. I think these people that maybe are too optimistic as to what it can achieve. But there's so many pessimists, you know, at the moment. So you're going to have more nuclear plants, and we'll see where it yeah. goes. Yeah, I agree. All right, well, Rod, thank you very much for this chat. I appreciate right. it, and thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Enjoyed it. We'll talk again right. soon. All right, take care, everyone. Thank you. All right, bye.